In the lecture today, I'd like to talk about another aspect of orogenic wedge theory, and that's four arc basins, which I'm going to argue are a special case, what we call wedge top basins. These are sedimentary basins that are associated with orogenic belts and thus are linked to the theory of orogenic wedges. So four arc basins are found between the trench and the arc in pretty much all marine settings and also many continental settings. But in the marine setting where we have true oceanic subduction, it's one of the major structural features of, a, of an active margin. So we see here as an example, Southeast Asia, the Sumatra, uh, uh, the island of Sumatra, the subduction zone and the trench that run along the, the uh, coast here of Indonesia. And we have an accretionary wedge between the trench and the arc but the high, the topographic high is this series of islands that, that uh, fall right along the coastline here, behind which is a small basin. And if we look at the, uh, for example, seismic data that are imaging the structure, the crustal structure of the forearc, we see that the active accretionary prism is actually limited to the immediate vicinity of the trench. We have then accreted material further back in the system without a lot of evidence of deformation, sometimes deformed, sometimes not. But between this uh, accreted material then and really what's the basement going up then to the volcanic arc is this four arc basin. And this region is filled with sediments. If we look in uh, a closer view and look at the internal structure of this four arc basin, you can see the stratigraphic layering. This is a seismic section, it's more or less in this region. This uh, here on the left is this, uh, uh, part of the accretionary complex here, uh, but you see between here and the basement of the of the arc here, it's largely undeformed sediments, somewhat deformed here against the edge, but mostly almost flat line sediments that define this four arc basin. If we zoom in on, on another example of this and look at a little more detail at the seismic structure, this is the Philippines, uh, Philippine margin, the Luzon margin. So this is the Manila Trench here where the South China Sea is subducting underneath uh, Luzon. So these are the islands of the Philippines, uh, including the Luzon active volcanic arc here. Cross sections that look across here show some of the same morphology as we saw in Indonesia. We have a trench, we have an accretionary complex, there's a structural and topographic high. Uh, and then behind this, we have a four arc basin. This is presumably sitting on top of, uh, of upper plate continent, crustal material that goes then up to the volcanic arc. And again, if we zoom in on this four arc basin, we can see uh, here, this is now the, the North Luzon Trough or Fork Basin. We have here at least an interpreted uh, contact then with the, with the arc basement. And on this side, then the accretionary complex. Here are the uh, four arc basin sediments, almost flat line here, they're folded, uh, which indicates that there is some kind of a thrusting and uplift of the accretionary complex on this side. Uh, but then it's just a gentle onlap on this side, relatively flat line. So we would interpret this as being not tectonically active, but the accretionary complex could be tectonically active uh, with some back thrusting in this region here. So the kind of schematic setting then of this is that the accretionary wedge is in fact limited in its landward extent. And we have this, uh, what really starts to look again like this doubly virgin tectonic setting where we have a frontal wedge on this side, we have a back thrust wedge on this side over the arc basement. But the, set, the hole between the, the structural high of the accretionary wedge and the volcanic arc is this topographic hole then is filled with sediments and this then defines the four arc basin. So this is a, a, a type of a tectonic basin. It's tectonically controlled. The accommodation space for the sediments is controlled by the degree of back thrusting and uplift of this, of this outer arc high. But there are many other ways in which sediments can be stored in an active tectonic setting and can be associated with orogenic wedges. We have, of course, the, the classic case of a four deep or a, a foreland basin, which would which be indicated by this system. We have a foreland basin. We have a relationship then between the thrusting of the uh, of the orogenic belt here and the four and the uh, sediments of the foreland basin out here. Uh, 
uh, as these get, uh, as this relationship is, becomes more complex, perhaps due to overfilling of the Portland Basin so that these uh, thrust faults are, are overtopped by sediments or new thrusts are formed deeper in the sediment, we can have a relationship uh, something like this where parts of the thrust system are in fact covered by the uh, sediments of the Portie. If these structures grow, we can even end up with, a, with an isolated depot center of the four deep. For example, here with a structural high, this could even become emergent with no sediments on top of it, and then an outer four deep like this. With less sediment infill, it's also possible to have what we refer to as wedge top basins or piggyback basins, where the, where the sediments are confined to the gap between thrust sheets. So in a case like this, where we have isolated thrust sheets, but we have sediment fill between them, we can have small isolated uh, basins that are sitting on top of a, of a single isolated thrust sheet. Or, and of course, more, more complex relationships, sediment draping over the entire system. If it's, if it's very high uh, sediment flux into the basin, you know, perhaps very uh, deep, four deep with the thrust confined to the four deep or some combination of uh, uh, deformation of the sediments rather than draping like this. So these are sort of examples of pro wedge basins where you have a very active fold truss belt thrusting on the on the margins of the basin and that's interacting then with the sedimentation. Just to show you an example of this in, in topography in an active system, this is from the Tian Shan in, in China, north of the Tibetan Plateau. We have a, an actively uplifting uh, mountain range here. Uh, this is a, a kind of fold and thrust belt. It may be rather thick skinned, but it is a, a deep seated thrusts that are bringing up the rocks here. And this is propagating out into this basin out in the, in the, in the front of the thrust belt. And what we see out here is the next thrust forming. So this is a topographic high where there's a, a thrust and an associated fold that's associated with that thrust that's coming up through the sediments, it's uplifting the sediments, it's being incised, but you can see it's beginning to then trap sediments behind this growing fold and thrust system out here. So this is, a, for example, a large alluvial fan. It's being deposited out here in this, uh, in this topographic low. Some of it, the sediment may be escaping out here, but it's, it's becoming slowly trapped by this uplifting thrust sheet. And you can imagine that if this grows that much more, it could even cut off these rivers and we could have a complete closed basin here between this thrust and the, and the older mountain belt behind it. We also have examples where, where thrust belts are, are sort of overwhelmed or completely covered by the sedimentation. And this is one we've probably already seen. This is the Apenninic front. So this is uh, the north virgin thrust belt from the Apennines that's propagating into the Po Plain. And what we can see here is that there are Miocene sediments that are deformed so in a series of thrusts and, and folds. But these are in fact draped then by, by Pliocene or Quaternary sediment that almost completely fill, well, it does completely fill the topography. There's essentially no topography left here. Uh, the, this, they're still deformed and slightly folded in places, the Quaternary sediments, but it's clear that the main thrusts are in fact completely draped and covered by, the, uh, by this influx of, of Quaternary sediment on top of, uh, of these active structures. So if we go back to the marine setting and think a little bit about uh, what, what these processes and structures look like in the marine setting, this is looking now in Japan at the Nankai margin in southern Japan. This is the, uh, the island of Honshu here. This is a very large uh, active accretionary wedge system. There's a long history of, of subduction underneath Japan here. So we've developed quite a large and, and active accretionary complex as we, as we arrive then onto, uh, onto land here. Uh, this is the, the coastline is back here. Uh, this is the trench out here. And we have here what's, what's called the Kumano Basin, which is uh, uh, one of a whole series of these four arc basins, which, which form these, uh, uh, these sort of blue blobs along the coastline here. So we have a coast. This is where the active uh, arc would be back in here. We have the trench. We have an accretionary complex. And on top of the accretionary complex and behind it are these series of little four arc basins. And if we look at the structure of this, this is quite interesting. So again, we're at the Kumano Basin here now along looking at this uh, structure here. This is a place that's been well studied with three dimensional seismic data, which can be used then to construct a structural model that we're seeing in sort of block form here. <clears throat> 
And what we can see is that this accretionary complex with all the thrusts forming from the trenches out, out here at the, at the edge, we have a decollement, which you can see it imaged uh, along here. And then we have this series of thrusts, including what's called a megasplay thrust, this, which is a large thrust that comes off directly off of the, the decollement and rises to the, uh, to the surface and sort of isolates this accretionary complex out here and separates that from, uh, from what is part of the forearc back here. This uh, part of the forearc is uh, again deformed. We can see deformation at depth. This is almost entirely accreted sediments. Uh, probably, we don't know exactly what's down here. But what's important here is that it's topped by almost undeformed sediments. This is the Kumano Basin. So this is the forearc or wedge top basin. The, the sediments are deformed, but only gently. So we can see some gentle folding or we see tilting, particularly here along the, along the front. They might be slightly tilted, but they're uh, relative to the underlying accretionary complex, they're undeformed, right? And this then is, uh, it defines, a, and although, even though they, they sit on top of the, the deformed accretionary material, they themselves are not terribly deformed, which indicates that at the time of their deposition, uh, the, most of these structures were inactive. And there are many examples of these sorts of basins. This is now a true wedge top for our basin. So this is somewhat different from uh, say the, the basins that I showed you in the very first slides, which were really trapped between the accretionary wedge and the arc basement with much of the sediment being deposited on that arc basement. Here, almost everything is being deposited on top of the accretionary wedge itself. This is another example from Chile. This is the Valparaiso basin. Uh, looking at the, so again, here's the structure with the trench, the arc is up here, and we're, we're essentially looking at the region between the coastline and the, uh, the outer arc high. And the structure of this uh, is, is shown here. This is the active accretionary complex. This is an older accretionary complex. Parts of it are, uh, were active during some of the deposition. Uh, Perhaps you know, we have this separation between part of the basin here and part of the basin here. But for the most part, these sediments, are, especially the later ones, are not very deformed. One of the interesting aspects of this sort of system is this forms exactly over where the large earthquakes are. So if you know all the largest earthquakes in the world occur at subduction zones, and the, and the very largest ones occur uh, pretty much directly in this area underneath these four arc basins between the coastline and then the accretionary complex. This is showing these, these little circles and patches, the white lines are showing the slip uh, parts of the, of the detachment, what slipped during several large earthquakes, magnitude 7.8, magnitude eight in 1985 and so on. So these are the areas that tend to uh, have the, the, the largest mega thrust earthquakes. One more example of, uh, of these kinds of four arc wedge top basins is, is Cascadia, which we uh, have already looked at. We, we just saw a little story about the Olympic Mountains up here, but this is part of the Cascadia system, subduction zone that, that extends all along the coastline here. It has a very broad uh, continental shelf, this area for an active margin. And again, if we look at the structures on a, on a section across that going from the trench, which is out here, we see that we have again a, a deforming accretionary complex. There's a little piggyback basin right here sitting on top of this uh, thrust system here, that big thrust sheet here. Again, thrusts, then we have, uh, an, as we come up onto the shelf, outer and intercontinental shelf, we have an increasing drape of sediments over the top of these formerly deformed uh, accreted materials. So down here, again, we see many little faults, thrusts all through here. This is an old accretionary complex. But these are not active, at least not very active, because again, we have undeformed sediments that are, that are overlapping, that are onlapping and covering all of these active structures. They could be somewhat deformed in their, in their seaward extent, maybe some folding, but for the most part, they're not deformed. So the, uh, again, the picture of this sort of thing, if we want to combine that back with the, say, the Olympic story that I was showing you, the Olympics were uplifting, right? This was this uplifting four arc high that was talking about the, the erosional impact. Uh, this, is a, this is the pattern of uplift that's been interpreted from things like the thermochronometry and terrace studies and so on. So this part is uplifting, but immediately land or seaward of this, 
is a four arc basin. There's another four arc basin back here, but that's kind of another story. That's again, this, this sort of first type of four arc basin that's trapped behind an active volcanic arc in this uplifting four arc high. But the one that I was just showing you is sitting out here on the continental shelf between the coast and the structural high or the shelf slope break out here. And uh, it's, it's sitting on top of a accreted material. So how does that form and why? This is again linked, I think anyway, to the, to the uh, wedge, critical wedge conditions of this uh, uh, accretionary complex that's in the offshore. And I think what's key to understanding how these form is to look at the geometry of the critical wedge that's, that is offshore here between the trench and the uplifting four arc high. And what's important to note about, about accretionary wedges at this scale is that they're forming on top of a curved decomont. So the detachment surface underlying the, the wedge, uh, I, you know, I keep talking about the low angle of these, de these detachments, but that's out at the toe. That's sort of out here between the trench and, and some distance in some tens to hundreds of kilometers inland, at which point the subducting slab starts to curve down underneath the upper plate. Right? And all slabs must curve. And that means that the detachment, which is associated with the top of the slab, must also curve. Well, what does that imply for the, for the critical wedge? Well, let's go back to our, our basic relationship between decomont dip and surface slope. And what do, we, what do we know about this? Well, whatever the physical parameters are, we know that this is a, a function which dips down in this direction. The deeper, the steeper the dip of the decomont, the lower the surface slope. And that means that if we're out at the toe, say out here, uh, we might have a decomont dip of four degrees. We have a, a surface slope of, in this case, maybe two or three degrees, right? That's the, this kind of frontal active part of the system. So we move back into the system then, for example, back here to a point, uh, we might find now the decomont dip is five to 10 degrees, something like this. And the surface slope is something like minus two degrees. What, what, what does a negative number here mean? Well, in fact, it, the, the wedge doesn't really care which way uh, it's dipping. This is, a, this is saying that if the decomont dip is large enough, that surface slope can be negative, which means that it's dipping towards land, right? So this, what this is suggesting then is that the, the surface slope here would be positive here but it would start to bend over following the curvature of, this, of the slab. And in fact, it should go negative at some point and start dipping towards the land. So coming down in a direction, something like this, okay? Well, what if that were true? I mean, that, there's nothing wrong with that. A critical wedge depends on the taper angle, not the direction of the surface slope. So there's no problem to have a surface that dips towards the land, but that says that then that the critical wedge should curve parallel to this slope and start dipping towards the land. Well, why don't we see that? Well, what would happen if that did happen? If it was, cur if it was dipping towards the land and we had some, uh, say an older four arc high, we, you know, this, this could be uplifting for other reasons having to do with say viscous deformation of the edge of the continent. You know, if we didn't have this high, we would still have the volcanic arcs. We'd have positive topography out here. We would have positive topography out here and then a negative topography in here. Well, that's going to be a perfect sediment trap. If you have a big hole in the ground, that's just simply going to fill up with sediments. And that's exactly where this four arc basin is forming then, or this is an argument. This is why the four arc basin is forming. The, the wedge, the critical wedge would like to dip landward. As soon as it starts to, to do that, that means uplift of this region, it simply gets filled in with four arc basin sediments. Well, what, uh, what does that imply then for the critical wedge? Well, that's kind of interesting because if the, if the critical wedge on a decolmont, say here's another example where the decolmont dip is something like 12 or 13 degrees, the surface slope would like to be minus five degrees in order to be critical. But if we fill that in with sediment, what happens to the surface slope? It's gonna be zero. It's going to be simply uh, filled in flat, flat means zero. Well, if the surface slope is zero, but the critical slope is minus five, that means that this wedge has now been pushed up into the stable regime. Again, go back if you would, if you to the critical wedge theory and think about this, this is the minimum cr critical taper line. This is subcritical down here. This is stable up in this domain. What does stable mean? Stable means that the wedge 
does not deform internally, but it still slides along its detachment and still accretes material into its toe. So it, it will be in a constant state of deformation at the toe, trying to reduce that surface slope down to be at the critical state right here. How does it reduce the surface slope? It does it by uplifting the toe region, trying to dip back landward. But as fast as it can uplift, sediment is going to come into that basin and fill it, and it's going to hold it at this, uh, at this zero level. So what we're going to end up with is a kind of geometry that looks like this. This is the accretionary complex. It's trying, it's uplifting, it's deforming, it's trying to dip landward, but the but the, if the sediment supply is high enough, it will simply fill in with sediment and that holds this part of the uh, system in a, in a stable state. And this is why in fact, these sediments remain undeformed, right? This part of the wedge is in fact stable because the sediment has, has raised the slope up to zero instead of being negative. This part of the wedge is deforming. And up here is, is a numerical model of this process that shows that in fact this works. Here's a dipping, curved dipping decomant under here. The part, the frontal part of the wedge system is, uh, uh, is deforming. This is the active wedge. When we reach a, a, a key point, and this key point is in fact where the surface slope or the alpha goes negative, uh, at that point, then this part of the wedge will become undeforming. And the colors here are the strain rate with the uh, hot colors being the uh, being high strain rate, purple being then blues being essentially zero strain rate. So what's happening is the internal part of the wedge here is not deforming. The external part of the wedge is deforming. And this uplift is then giving the accommodation space to fill this in with, uh, with sediments. You can also then ask the question, well, what, <clears throat> what would happen if uh, there were not sufficient sediment supply to fill that, to fill that basin? And this is uh, showing numerical models of the deformation of an accretionary wedge to show exactly that case. If there is no sediment filling of the hole, the accretionary wedge will in fact dip landward. And that's the upper surface, it's positive here, and then it's starting to dip towards the land here. Uh, and then we have uplift to this fork high above the backstop. This is again due to things like viscous deformation at depth. This region is staying thick and going up, but we're, we're essentially creating a hole here uh, by, by the accretionary growth of this accretionary wedge and attainment of a negative slope in this region here. Notice again the deformation. This is strain rate again. So here you can see the deformation rate in this uh, model of the accretionary wedge. This is all deforming throughout this entire region here, right? And then we can contrast that to a model which has now sediment fill. And this is maybe a little hard to see, but these fine white lines are showing levels of sediment fill. So this is the formation of a fork basin, just essentially filling in this hole up to a, up to a horizontal slope. And if we do that, then that, ten, that tends to shut off the deformation in this region pushes it outboard so that what we, uh, what we see is an active frontal wedge, but no deformation in this region here. So we can look at some of the predictions of these kinds of models, in particular, looking at seismic data and the structures of these accretionary wedge or arc basin contacts. One of the predictions is that the outer part of the basin should be thrust bounded. That is, this, uh, this is the limit between the actively deforming accretionary wedge and the stable wedge. So even though the decolmont is moving, is slipping along the entire region, the internal deformation is limited to this uh, toe or active part of the accretionary wedge. So if we look, for example, in, on, in Oregon, on Cascadia, we can see that, uh, in fact, this is the case. Here's an active thrust. We have an active outer arc high that's uplifting. It's back tilting the sediments back here. So these uh, you know, older structures, older sediments, older layers are, are in fact back tilted with onlap of the, of the younger material. This is another example over here. You can see it's, it's almost folded uh, due to the motion on this active thrust. Once we're under the basin, no more deformation. It's almost entirely flat lying. <clears throat> 
On the landward side, it can be more complex because uh, first of all, it's not so clear again why this area is even uplifting. This is the, the active four arc high, the coastal ranges, uh, Olympic Mountains and so on. This is the back part of the wedge system. It's not clear if this is sort of a back thrusting zone associated with the basement and the backstop here, or if this has to do, uh, as in this particular model that I'm showing here, this has to do with viscous or ductile deformation in the lower crust down in this region here, where you see the higher strain rates. In any case, so this area is uplifting. This is, again is the Olympic Mountain coastal range uh, equivalent. And we end up with this kind of a, uh, again, a tilted, so in this case, it's a, a you know, tilted and onlapping Pliocene sediment on top of a uh, truncated or a, a unconformity between the late Miocene and the, and the early Pliocene material here. So this part was at, at one point uplifted and eroded. Now it's subsiding beneath the basin here, perhaps due to the basin loading with this onlap relationship here. So this kind of a, uh, this is another kind of wedge top basin, but it's a little bit different mechanism now. This is, uh, the, I, I showed some examples of pro wedge basins earlier, which were little piggyback basins that were simply sediments trapped behind individual thrust sheets. This is now a different kind of basin and it's much larger, much more extensive, and it owes its existence to this stability of the wedge, which is driven by the, the backward tilting. And this kind of a, a system, this kind of a basin wedge system uh, can occur in, in terrestrial settings as well. And in fact, I'm going to show you an example here now from the Alps where it might actually fit exactly this kind of a model of, of a subcritical or a stable uh, wedge with, a, with an active toe. So this is the molasse basin. Now the molasse basin, of course, is, is a classic 40 basin. It, it is in fact you know, used in textbooks and so on as the example of the kind of stratigraphy that we get in a four deep. And this is the, here's the molasse basin in a four deep in front of a, a growing uh, orogenic belt, the Alps. Uh, and it was in fact a four deep and much of its history, but what's the last thing that happened then in the uh, Alpine deformational history? Well, the most recent deformation is occurring out here. This is the Jura Mountains out on the, you know, the border. Some of it's in France, the border with uh, France and Switzerland, for example, or another cross section down here. This is, a, this is the Jura active, well, it was active, fold and thrust belt. Okay, it's both folding and thrusting. It's, it's, a, it's a little wedge out here. This formed uh, really quite recent in the Alpine history, probably the last 15 million years. It's probably shut off now in the last uh, three to five million years or so. But uh, between about 15 and five, this was the active deformation front from the Alps. So at that point, the Molassa Basin back here was not the 4 deep at all. It was actually a, a wedge top basin. The Jura are attached to the Alps through a decolmont, which is traveling along underneath the Mesozoic cover from here all the way under back here in order to connect to the deformation in the Alps. So this is uh, in fact an active, or was at the time, this was the active detachment underlay the entire uh, Molassa Basin. That means that the Molassa Basin was detached and was actually part of the wedge at this time. So the, the uh, deposition that occurred at that time was not in fact 40 deposition, but was a kind of wedge top uh, 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 sedimentary basin. So in fact, we have this transition between the earlier stages of the Alpine uh, origin where the Alpine wedge was deforming here, the molasse was the four deep in front of the wedge. The difference between say this phase and the later phase, this is marked here as a, a 12 MA, uh, is that we in fact subducted an evaporite. This Triassic, triassic salts were, uh, that, that appeared out in, in the four deep or the sub four deep sediments here were subducted underneath the, the, the basin. The salts are very weak. That has a tendency then to, to decrease the taper angle and make it very easy to, to slip. And in fact, uh, this detachment eventually did fail or became a detachment forming in the Triassic evaporites. And it allowed this entire, the entire uh, molasse basin to propagate over the, the basement along this detachment and trigger the deformation of the, uh, of, of the 
you're a uplift and eventually fold and, and thrust belt. So the final stage, sort of this, this 12 to MA stage of the Alpine deformation had the molasse basin detached. It was a wedge top basin. And we formed then the critical wedge of the, of the Jura out in the very, the very tip, the very northernmost extent of the Alpine deformation. And this sort of fits this idea of a four arc or wedge top basin and that we have a critical zone and then we have a stable zone. The Molassa basin was never extensively deformed. So even though it was sliding on the detachment here, it was not deforming internally. So it was not part of the critical wedge and instead was one of these stable zones.